All right, let's look at the FizzBuzz problem. So this is a very popular uh, tr programming challenge used in interviews for programming positions. And uh, it's really effective in terms of showing if someone knows how to program or not. So let me explain. A lot of people have the perception that just because you have some sort of CS degree, that that means you know how to program. However, this is completely false. Just because someone has a degree in computer science does not mean that they know how to program. And the FISBUS problem is really effective at showing who can and cannot effectively write code. And so one qualm I really have with this industry is that a lot of programmers come out and they're able to regurgitate these really complex algorithms, you know, maybe some sort of sorting algorithm, for example, uh, but they can't actually solve a problem or write a new algorithm by themselves. And this is a big problem. You know, quite frankly, I, I, I don't care if you're able to regurgitate a bubble sort in front of me. That, that tells me nothing in terms of your ability to write good code. What the FizzBuzz problem does is it gives someone the opportunity to solve a problem, to write an algorithm by themselves. And that is why it's an effective challenge to give in these interviews. So the very first thing I would do with the interviewee here is uh, number one, let them choose the language that they want to use. You know, let them use something that they're comfortable with. This isn't, you're not trying to test whether or not they know how to use a programming language necessarily. You're just trying to see if they know how to work through a problem logically. It's a big part of programming. So let them choose the language. Uh, like nine times out of 10, uh, I will see people choose Python as their, their language of choice, uh, which is fine. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Just let them choose which one they like to use. In this case, I'm using Lua. All right. So once they choose a the language that they want, uh, ask them to write a loop from one to 10. Now, in my experience, I like to give the problem one piece at a time without showing the other pieces first. Some people like to show the whole problem at once. You know, it depends on how you're trying to get them to think and solve the problem. I like to break it down into pieces like this and reveal things as we go, kind of simulating the idea that you know requirements get added as time goes on and how do we adapt to that. So write a loop from one to 10. Again, a lot of people I know will uh, choose Python to do this. And so if I pull this up, this is the Python solution for that simple part for step one. Uh, for number and range, 1 to 101, print number. Uh, it's exclusive list here at the end. That's why it has to be 101 and not 100. And that will do it. That'll print a number from 1 to 100. Nice and simple. However, I actually see a lot of people get tripped up right here at the beginning, uh, people that choose Python in particular. And I think the reason for this is that these people aren't really Python developers. They, they use Python to do little tasks here and there but they're not actually Python programmers. And the reason I, I assume that to be the case is they get tripped up on what this is. They don't know this function, this range function. And I, I assume that most of them are probably just iterating through arrays such as this. You know, maybe they have a list of numbers. I don't know, something like this. Now, in order to iterate through a list in Python, it's really easy. You just throw the list in the loop uh, definition like that, and that's it. You know, now if I did this, it would print 5, 10, 15, 1. Um, but as soon as you get rid of this list, uh, a lot of people are really clueless as to what to do. And it's the range function. And so if people get tripped up in this, I will usually provide that information to them to let them know. All right, so in Lua, what is this? It's very simple. Just like that, right? We have, we define i as a number from 1 to 100. Um, and implicitly the step is going to be a one, so you don't have to write that. So one to 100 print i. So if I run that command here, I will see a list of numbers from one to 100. Uh, for the first part of this challenge, just so I keep my output uh, smaller, I'm just going to go from one through 10 and we will expand that later. Okay, so once they have the for loop done and they're outputting the number, I will reveal step two. So step two is if the number is divisible by three, output fizz. All right, so this is where people get tripped up a lot too, because what this is asking is to develop an algorithm in which we can check if our current iterator number here, in this case, i, 
is divisible by three. So, so how do we check this? Uh, now, this is where you really start to be able to see how someone thinks through a problem. How are they going to solve this issue? And let's work through that. So instead of just throwing down the most optimal solution, which some of you may know, let's work through it from a logical view first, and then we can kind of make it more performant. Again, really performance is not what you're checking for in this problem. You're saying, can they solve the problem? Again, efficiency, optimization, we, we don't care about that stuff right now. And that, that comes later. We need to be able to write the algorithm, figure out the logic behind it first, and then go back and make it better. So what is the logic here? So we need to work through this. You know, first of all, maybe we want to see what does the number look like when we even divide it by three. Uh, so let's do that. So let's you know create a new variable, take our iterator number and divide it by three, and let's also output that with our number. Okay. So if we run this, we get this list of numbers. So we see that one divided by three is 0 0.3 repeated. Two divided by three is 0 0.6 repeated. Three divided by three is one so on and so forth. Well, if we look at this list, we can actually start to pick out a pattern. Now, what is that pattern? We see that numbers that are divisible by three have a whole number as the resultant, and numbers that are not divisible by three do not. So there's our pattern that we can pick up on. So if somehow, if we divide our number and it's divisible by that number, we get a whole number back. In other words, there's no remainder, there's no decimal attached to it. So now we can kind of develop an algorithm around that idea, right? So how can we do that? Uh, now this is, you know, you could go in 10 different directions here, and there's a better one that I'll show later down the line, but one that you know, might pop in the head of most people is, you know, maybe I can trim off this decimal at the end and uh, check that against the original value to see if they're the same. So for instance, you know, uh, let's do the three and the four as an example. So four divided by three is 1.3 repeated. Okay, so what if I trimmed off the 0.3 repeated part? So I just had the one. So now I have the one, and now let me compare it to the original value where we didn't trim it off. So one, and then 1.3 repeated. Are they equal? No, one is not equal to 1.3. So we know that four is not divisible by three. If we look at three, if we cut off the decimal on 1.0 repeated, uh, it's just one. And so when we compare that to the original value of one, it's the same. So we know, oh, that's the same value. It's, it must be divided, it, might, it, it must be divisible by that number. All right, so how can we do that in code? Well, the easiest way would be to use the math floor function. You know, the majority of programming languages have this out of the box, so, Maybe we could define it as floor equals math up floor and the original number here. Okay, so what we want to check here is if that floor number is equal to the original result of our division. So if it is, we know that it must be divisible by that number. So let's try it. Run that code. And uh, sure enough, it is. So we see that when the number is divisible by three, uh, when it, the result is a whole number, we see true outputted. And when it's not, we see false outputted. So it seems to work. So that's pretty nice. All right. And again, I think there's a better way to do this. And let's look at that now. So instead of simply, you know, doing all of this jargon right here, instead we can use the modulus operator. And what's cool about that modulus operator is that it's going to return the remainder of our divisor. So let's experiment down the output first. If I do six modulus three, and the modulus operator in most languages is usually gonna be uh, the percentage sign, it can be different though. So if I do that on six modulus three, basically what this is doing is saying six divided by three and give me the remainder back. So it should be zero, right? Let's try it. So six modulus three, I print that out and we get zero. Okay, so that seemed to work. What about seven? So let's work through this in our head first. So seven divided by three, uh, you know, what's the remainder gonna be of that? Well, it's gonna be one, right? So if we do that and we print it out and sure enough, we get a one. We go to eight divided by three and get the remainder two. But the next number is nine. We know nine is divisible by three, so the remainder should be zero. 
And sure enough, it is. And so now we have a kind of a different way to check if a number is divisible by another. So we can simply check if the remainder is zero. So let's change this. So instead of all these two lines of code, we could say divisible by three equals our number modulus three is equal to zero. Just like that. And now we'll just print out divisible by three and let's try that. And sure enough, we get the correct result back. So on three, six, and nine, we get trues back and all the other ones are false. So we've been able to successfully figure out if a number is divisible by three. Okay, so now that we've done that, what's the next part of this problem on step two? Output fizz. So what I'm gonna do is now write an if statement. So again, you're gonna be able to check, uh, does the interviewee have the understanding of how to write an if statement? You know, hopefully if they got to the point where they can figure out if a number is divisible by another, usually they can, uh, but this will check. So if divisible by three, then print fizz, else print the number. Okay, so let's see if we've successfully done step two. So we run our code and sure enough, we got one, two fizz, four, five fizz, seven, eight fizz, 10. So it looks like we successfully finish step two. All right, so what's step three then? Step three, we add a little more complexity to the algorithm in a kind of an interesting, clever way, which kind of forces to see if the person knows how to reuse code effectively. So what's step three? If the number is divisible by five, output buzz. And so even just looking at step three, we can tell that two and three have quite a bit of reusability in terms of their similarities in the problem. So the only difference here is instead of checking for divisibility by three, we're checking by five and we're outputting something different. So the logic is gonna be pretty similar, but how do we do it? So one way we could do it, we could just copy and paste this and check for the five instead. All right, and then maybe throw an else if here, divisible by five and print buzz. And sure enough, this will work. You know, that, that is the solution to that second step. So one, two, fizz on three, four, five, we get buzz because five is divided by, divisible by five. Fizz, seven, eight, fizz, and then 10 is divisible by five, so we get buzz. Okay, so we've successfully done step three. However, this is a good opportunity to test if the person knows how to do something like write a function, you know, some sort of abstraction of your algorithm uh, for reusability, because maybe you want to make it more dynamic. You know, maybe instead of five, we want to check a six or see if it's divisible by seven. How can we do that quickly? So really a better way to do this is to write a function. So maybe we have a function is divisible by, if I spell it right. So maybe we get our number and the number we're dividing by. So we can return in modulus d is equal to zero, just like that. So then we can swap this out for i and a three. And similarly, here with a five. So now we have this reusable algorithm, even though it's simple, it's one line, it's quite simple, but we have this and we can reuse it whenever we want with whatever number we want. So let's just try to run that again to make sure that that worked. And sure enough, it did. All right, so the next part of this algorithm, we're gonna have to expand this loop a little more. I'm just gonna go up to 30. Step four, if the number is divisible by three and five, output fizz buzz. Okay, so this is another part that trips up a lot of people and I'll show you why. All right, so a lot of people will just add on to their statements here. So they'll throw here and an and statement there, and print fizz buzz. This is a thing I see a lot of people do in this problem, right? They, they just add to their else ifs chain here and they, they, they do the condition properly here, but let's see what happens. So before we run it, we know that the number has to be divisible by three and five. 
So in what cases is that true? Uh, you know, the lowest common denominator between three and five, just to spoil it, is 15. So we know that on the 15, we should expect to see fizz buzz. So let's run it and see what happens. So we go to where 15 should be. Well, we only see fizz. We don't see the fizz buzz here. So we know something's not working right here. It seems like, you know, the logic makes sense here and everything that should work. Now the problem here, to some it might be obvious, to some it might not be, uh, it's the order of operations of our statement chain here. And so let's look, and it says it's, it's outputting fizz. So where do we output fizz in our code? Well, right here. And what's the statement that's capturing that? If the number is divisible by three. So yes, that's true. 15 is divisible by three. And so it's outputting fizz. But then it stops there because this is an else if chain, right? So once it gets here, it, it doesn't even check these conditions at all. Uh, and so it has no chance, it has no opportunity to even get to this last else if to check if it's divisible by three and five. So the really simple solution to this is to simply move this around. So instead of having this as the last part of our else if chain, we need to make it the first. So I'm just gonna cut that paste it at the top and change some of the, the wording there. So now the first check is to see if it's divisible by three and five and to output fizzbuzz. So let's rerun this and see what we get. All right, so go back to the 15 there and we see fizzbuzz. So now it seems to be working properly and we can check to make sure all the other values are still outputting as expected. We see the 30 also does fizzbuzz. All right, so for all intents and purposes, this is what I would say is a finished version of the FizzBuzz challenge. Now, whether or not they decided to throw this into a function doesn't really matter a whole lot. That's ideal, but if they didn't, that's okay. If they just kept it in line here, that's fine as well. There are some people that would want this to be further optimized in various different directions. That's okay. Uh, for me, if someone's able to get somewhere around this point in the, the challenge, I would say, you know, they clearly understand how to see the problem and solve it. And uh, that proves to me that they know how to program.